So today we're going to finish this uh, emphasis, exploring wider questions in largest. We said that stories, uh, as we dive into them, inform us about certain things, and questions enlarge our world as we look wider than we normally might look. Next week, when we talk a little bit about climbing higher, we're going to see that ethics really are at the heart of what makes life uh, purposeful and meaningful, not only to me, but to those around us as well. So this is the last time you're going to look at this set of slides. We've said that this is all interconnecting. All these questions somehow interconnect with other questions. So we talked a little bit about how did it all begin. We asked the question, who is God? And we said God is light, love, and spirit, and the whole of every whole. Uh, in him we live and move and have our being. And then we talked about humanity being a part of the progressive nature of creation at a point in time after billions of years of God allowing the universe to evolve, uh, there is this designation of those that are made in the image of God and they are designated as Adam and Eve and are to carry forward uh, the work of God through the ongoing development of civilization and through uh, ch uh, challenging uh, process of learning how to be unified and loving among a variety of different ethnicities uh, and cultures. We talked a little bit about how it, religion interplays with that, and it really is a kaleidoscope of different colors and shapes in the world around us in relationship to religion. But there is some things in commonality. Uh, worship is a part of that, using different tools in the process of worship. You have creeds, you have liturgies, and you have different things in di some world religions like idols and icons. And all of these things, even things like stained glass, is to uh, enlarge the imagination, to understand the story of the world and God's interrelationship with it. Then we talked a little bit about sin, which at its core is chaos, and chaos is in control and uh, is, is enabling other people to do inhumane things. And of course, we are still seeing that. Now there's two major world wars that are currently operating um, in Russia and Ukraine and of course Hamas and Israel. And uh, we continue to see how this uh, dehumanizes certain parts of the human race and that then justifies sometimes violence. Then we talked a little bit about salvation and the many-tiered level of salvation, things that lead to liberation and restoration, and ultimately a Hebrew word, shalom, which means peace. Then we talked a little bit about the Bible last week as a continued conversation, an ongoing process of trying to understand uh, God and humanity. Now today, we're going to try to put the pieces together on what is faith, and uh, I found this graphic here. Here's a piece of bread at one time that was unified but has been broken apart. And that's kind of the subject of faith in the Bible. It's kind of been torn apart. And we often look at just one little piece of it rather than seeing the whole of it. So there's four pieces of bread up here that made up a loaf. And I want you to think in terms of four different dimensions and dynamics of faith that I want to share with you here this morning. So... When we look in the Bible, what we're going to see is that the Bible really doesn't give to us a, an exhaustive, all-encompassing definition of faith. I guess the best we can do is from Hebrews 11.1 1, where it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now that might be a working definition, but it might not be that helpful. You know, how does that work itself out on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, we all live with certain elements of faith. We can be a believer, we can be a non-believer, we can be an agnostic, but faith is something that we all use every day when you think about it, okay? So, last night we went to bed, and we exercised faith that we would get up in the morning, that we would still be living and breathing and be able to carry on our lives. I don't know if you've ever looked at it like that, 
But for some people, when they laid their head down on the pillow last night, it was the last time they laid their head down on the pillow. So we operate by faith when we say things like, see in the morning. I love you. See in the morning, right? That there's something there tomorrow. When you walked into the room here today, you had faith. What was the faith that you had? You chose to sit on chairs. You didn't even think about it, but you had faith that that chair would hold you up once you sat down on it, right? Okay. Think about going to your favorite restaurant. They hand you a menu, and you operate by faith that the person that's in the back preparing the food, hi Kelly, <laughs> is doing it right, is doing it sanitary, and then when they bring the plate out to you and set it in front of you and you enjoy that meal, you are operating on faith that everything that has been placed in front of you is safe for you to consume. Not just in terms of whether you're going to enjoy the taste of it or not, but will it make you sick or not, okay? I'm sure some people have experienced food poisoning or whatever because they got some bad food at some point. So we all operate on a day-to-day -day basis with faith. However, when we talk about faith in terms of a definition like this, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, it's at a higher level than these everyday little things that we just assume. These sometimes are related to ultimate concerns. These are related to things about what life means, the purpose of life, what is there after life, those type of issues. You don't have to be a believer. You don't have to be religious. All of those questions run through our mind. And so what we share in common is faith is often these things that uh, are often very, very deep, a psychological perspective, if you will. And faith has something to do with an innate desire for meaning and purpose and significance. And that's ingrained in us from a, uh, the time we were toddlers, you know, from infancy, every human being has this innate sense that there is something more than just me, and there's a desire to discover what that is. So faith is not just something that's individual. It is something that is communal. It's something that is societal. It's something that is experimental uh, and experiential. And what we find is that our preoccupation uh, with this leads us down different roads. And people that uh, seek out different ways to try to answer the big questions of life are operating on faith that on the other side of it, there will be something that will give them some answers. Now, preoccupation with faith being simply some, a matter of the head, things that you believe in your head, can be things that can lead you down a wrong path because that's what often leads to I'm right, you're wrong. Okay, so let's let's look at a little bit more well-rounded understanding of faith. When you look into the scripture, you have this as kind of a definition. However, if you go to the writing of the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and even this faith is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's, even there, it's this idea, it's not just something that you are thinking or believing, it's something that God's enabling you to have, to have this confidence, this hope, uh, this longing for tomorrow. So here's what I want to do. I want to share with you four dynamics of faith. And we don't have the time this morning to take you into all the different uh, scriptures that illustrate this. But faith has an element of assent, an element of trust, an element of fidelity, and an element of vision. 
So let me just shortly explain what these four pieces represent. So when you look at ascent, this is often how we think about faith. It is something that we um, give a mental uh, a proposition to. In other words, I give assent to this is true. I believe, okay? So when you go on a church web website, one part of a church website is their statement of faith. And what that means is we believe in whatever. There might be a listing of four or five things. There might be a listing of 20 things. It just depends upon that congregation, how they want to, to relate that uh, information. But what's this element of faith is primarily cognitive. And what we mean by that is this is something that I am giving a mental assent to. I believe this to be true. So occasionally we'll use the Apostles' Creed here. We believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in his son Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, and so on and so forth. So these are all mental assents that we are giving. And on Reformation Sunday, uh, the Protestant side of the church will often say, okay, we believe in sola fide, single faith, um, this idea of sola scriptura, uh, we believe in the scripture, and so on and so forth. Now, all of that is up in the head. But as you know, and as I know, as we go through this world, there are many things that I can believe in my head, but we experience uh, things a lot differently in life. I might be able to say I believe this, this, and that, but then something comes along in life that is beyond your control. You're controlling what you believe in your mind. However, when you experience some pain, when you experience some suffering, and you don't have answers for that, all of a sudden, faith is no longer just a mental ascent. I believe God is good. I believe God can help. You really have to trust, okay? So you're beginning to then think, okay, I don't know where the resources are going to come from. Uh, I'm, I'm in financial need. I don't know where they're going to come from, but I am going to trust that God knows my need, and I am going to rely upon that uh, so it can be anything like that. You might have a health issue, and you might go, I know I can work through this, and I know I can feel better. But the element of trust is you then are trusting a doctor. You're trusting a prescription or a protocol of some type that's going to help you in that uh, journey. So assent and trust. Now, the element of faith that most people don't think about or uh, talk about is this idea of being um, a fidelity or an allegiance to something. In other words, faith has an element of loyalty or a commitment. Um, uh, it is something that you are giving yourself to. And when Jesus says, come, follow me to the early disciples, uh, this is an element of faith. They believe in this individual, Jesus, who has asked them to follow him. But then they have to drop their fishing nets, right? They have to actually get on the road with him. And so this loyalty, this fidelity to Jesus causes them to leave their careers, really, and to trust that what they are doing is worthwhile, meaningful, purposeful, uh, and those type of things, and there's a commitment to it. Are you following what I'm saying? The last element of faith that you'll find in the scripture is what I want to call vision. And this is the idea of a picture of a better world ahead. So I intentionally wore my Cleveland Brown sweatshirt today because I have faith or a vision that maybe they can win this game this afternoon. Now, you might say, boy, your faith isn't very realistic. But it's a hope. It's a vision. By the time the fourth quarter is done, that they will be on top and victorious. Well, a vision is something that you're looking forward to and trusting that things will get better. Um, every time uh, we make plans, um, 
we are by faith having a vision. So maybe you're already thinking about what you're going to do at Christmas or where you're going to go on vacation next year. And you have a vision that by, you know, next year or a certain day, you'll be able to get on a plane and go somewhere or see something that you really long to see. Now, will that transpire? We don't know. But it's something that you are looking forward to. It's lo something that you have faith will work out, that you, number one, won't be sick or have some type of a financial emergency that takes away the, uh, the money that you would use toward vacation. You know, all kinds of different scenarios. But if you look at uh, faith through these four pieces, I think you will have a better, well-rounded understanding of faith. Faith isn't just giving mental assent to something. It's much bigger than that. And you'll find that in various passages of Scripture. So with those four uh, elements, here's how I'd like to kind of define faith. Faith is a state of relative certainty about matters of ultimate concern sufficient to promote action. Now, Every part of this is important. Faith is a state. It can be an emotional state. It can be a mental state of relative certainty. You know, there's no such thing as absolute certainty. That's beyond our control. But I can have relative certainty on certain things that things are lined up for the future, so forth. About ultimate concerns, you know, I might have faith that someday we will actually get a pro quarterback on our team. Right, Dan? That's a, that's a vision, that's a trust, that's a faith. Um, but that's not an ultimate concern. You know, I don't live and die by that. It is something that I enjoy watching. It's something I enjoy experiencing. But it really doesn't matter whether... That uh, is true or not, because that's not what puts food on the table, right? Okay, so we have to keep remembering, and you've often heard this, it's just a game. It's just a game. It's not an ultimate concern. However, when a person has been diagnosed with cancer, when an individual has had their house burned down, uh, when these type of things, they become ultimate concerns because it's a very vulnerable situation at that point, okay? Now, the ultimate, ultimate concern, obviously, is this idea. Of we all know that at some point we're going to take our last breath. What happens after that? How does God interrelate to that? Is there life after death? What does that look like? Will it reunite me with those that have already gone before? You know, those are like ultimate issues. But even then, it is not sufficient unless it promotes me to action somehow. So when we think about things like ultimate concerns, we say, are there certain things that we need to do that helps put feet to my faith? You know, so it can, might be, you know, is there the chance that I might ex or we might experience a tornado, um, a flood? Well, then you go, oh, what actions should I take? Do I have the insurance to cover that? What are some things that will help protect me? I have faith that my house won't burn down or won't flood or I won't get into a life-threatening accident or those type of things. But at the same time, we don't uh, walk blindly forward, we go, there's some pieces that we need to have in place just in case there are certain things that happen. So action is an important part of that as well. And actually, that's what James' angle is in the New Testament. In the little epistle of James, this, uh, it says this in chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, ultimate concern. If, you, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? You might say, I have faith. You know, this is this whole thoughts and prayer nonsense that we see. You know, 
when you see mass shootings and stuff, it's another way of saying thoughts and prayers. We're not going to do anything about it. We're not going to take any actions that will prevent it in the future, but we're thinking about you. James would say, "Uh uh-uh. No. He goes on and says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, but I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God. Good, great. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? And then he goes on. And, but here's the key line here. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can faith save them? In other words, your faith has to have some feet to it. Okay, It's not just a mental ascent. It's not just trusting in tomorrow. But it is something that moves you to do something. Uh, and I would say that ultimately this is uh, a living faith then. Uh, James says, faith without deeds is dead dead. So when you think about all these different dimensions, then you begin to see putting the pieces together that faith is a pretty well-rounded perspective in the scripture. Now, we all go through different stages of faith, and that's what I want to kind of finish up with here today. Faith has kind of four uh, dynamics and dimensions to it. From simplicity to complexity to perplexity to harmony. Now, this uh, particular uh, thing comes out of uh, some of the writings of Brian McLaren. And um, he, uh, he writes a book about doubt. And the book has this kind of uh, uh, chapter division to it about how all of us doubt at times in our life. But our faith often looks different depending upon where we are at in our life. So he begins with the idea of simplicity. So let me explain what that means. This is that stage of faith where we give mental assent to something and we categorize things into good or bad, right? Good or evil. Um, And it's just something that we believe in our heads and it then becomes a way that we judge other people by because we have our own categories, good and bad, and we're good and they're bad. And this is an easy stage because it is something that creates an enemy. Uh, It's us versus them. They believe different than we do. We're good, uh, they're bad. We're right, they're wrong. So this can be very familiar and safe to people. And for people that have a kind of a stage one faith, I don't care if they're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, God is the big person in the sky that sets the rules, demands trust, and requires obedience. God is the ultimate authority figure. So you sort everything out by good or bad, and it's not only God that's an authority figure, But early on in our life, our parents are authority figures, our teachers are authority figures, police officers are authority figures. There's these different people that represent authority, and you have to do what they say. Religious people look to pastors, priests, other religious authorities to kind of sort out for them what is good, what is bad. And what happens is these authority figures often give people answers and then they come across as you can't doubt that, you can't question that, you can't think differently about that, or you've lost your what? Faith. No, no, that's not true. They're just emphasizing that simplicity of faith. But what they often say then doesn't work. So sometimes real zealots, I'm going to take an example in religion. God hates divorce. You're never allowed to get a divorce. 
I don't care how bad your husband's treating you. I don't care if you're being abused. The Bible says God hates divorce. Okay? That authority's been imposed upon a person, and then often a person that's in a, an abusive type of relationship will, will say, well, I, I don't have faith if I, if I feel I need to get out of this situation, right? Okay? That's simplistic thinking. And all of a sudden, you move to a more complex stage of life. You go, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. In other words, there are some times where divorce is absolutely necessary. A situation has become so dangerous and so abusive that you go, there is something wrong here to think that God is saying, just stay under this abusive situation. You're being faithful if you do so. And you begin to ask other questions. And these questions become more pragmatic and in their focus. And you begin to question simplistic answers like that. And when you do so, it will often put you kind of in an uncomfortable place because you have to deconstruct a lot of times some of the things that you have been told. And you have to reconstruct uh, a better view of things. So people that are in this complex stage of faith begin to question simplistic answers. And what once was a safe place, because you like somebody telling you what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, um, that you go, this at one time was a safe place for me, but now real life has hit me in the head, and I'm asking deeper questions. All of a sudden, this type of faith is a prison now. It's keeping me chained to unhealthy things. Well, as you move through that stage, you come to another stage, perplexity. And perplexity is where doubt is our friend. Because you begin to question and you begin to look at certain things with a clearer perspective. And people that are in stage three of their faith begin to understand that the world is not black and white. It's very complex. And that often leads us to scratching our heads at times, right? We, I don't know what this means or how we get out of this. The danger in this stage, though, is it's easy to become cynical. And you begin to question everything, whether it's the structures around you, the damage that's being done by unchallenged structures, or the authority figures that you begin to see, uh, they're saying one thing, they're doing another thing. There's suspicion sometimes that uh, comes in. And this is where a lot of times people will walk away from their faith. They begin to see, hey, simplistic answers don't work. Complex questioning raises further questions that does not seem to have answers to it. There are things that are so perplexing, like why does God allow evil in the world? Why does God allow suffering to occur? And for a lot of people, they go, that's it. I'm done. And they walk away from their faith, right? Because there's no easy answers to those questions. Those questions are very deep. Those questions are very complex. And many times, they're very perplexing that God doesn't run the world in a different way. You've heard people like this. Why does God allow hurricanes and torna tornadoes and tsunamis and all these type of things where people not only die, but they, they lose you know, their houses and all that type of thing? We're at this stage, I think, Right now, in our country, we're already over 300 mass shootings this year. 300. Oh, I don't know the exact number. I know it's over 300. Now, a mass shooting is where somebody, uh, where there are four or more people that have been shot by the same person, okay? So, the most recent example is in Maine, you know, where it's not even safe to take your family bowling, right? 
So that often leads to perplexity, uh, and it leads to doubting and deconstruction. And then the last stage is, oh, oh, if I just forsake everything, if I just walk away from my faith, then it leads a vacuum inside of me. Because there's this deep inner desire to have a connection to the divine and to have a sense of belonging and a sense of hope and assurance for what lies beyond. So you have to then begin to harmonize a lot of these things, the promises that you find that come from God in the scripture, your own personal experiences where you had this... um, epiphany moment where you really felt loved by God. God felt very close to you, along with all the tragedies and things that you see in the world. And you begin to try to harmonize all of these things, and you go, well, what then do I need to do? And um, Brian McLaren, in his book, uh, talks about a hermeneutic of love. Now, hermeneutic, hermeneutic is a big $60 word that means how you interpret not only the scriptures, but life as well. And so we can be cynical and suspicious. Uh, We can get angry and all these type of things. But ultimately, the way we harmonize our relationship with God and with one another is what Jesus said to a young man that came and asked, you know, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus said, you must love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Brian McLaren calls this the hermeneutic of love. You move ahead, and sometimes you don't have the type of certainty that you want. But the choice that you make in life of love is always the best choice, right? What does love look like? How is it carried out? Not only within your own personal life, but within a society. Um, Uh, I'm trying to remember who said this, but I remember the quote. Um, The quote is, justice, that word is often thrown around a lot. Justice is what love looks like publicly. I like that. Justice is what love looks like publicly. So you go, okay, it's not just about me, it's about us, the human family. What is the best way to move forward in love and trust that God will put people, leaders, and things in place to enable that. So that brings me to the story that we were talking about. So the story that I read earlier out of Mark chapter 9 is quite instructive. When you look at that story, if you want to reread it again in Mark 9, uh, 14 through 29, um, you'll find that there is a religious debate that is going on. It says here, the disciples and the teachers of the law are arguing. You might say that's a simplistic uh, uh, outlook on, on a situation. There's a right and a wrong. There's good and bad. And <clears throat> so there's a man who has a son that has this medical problem, and He comes to Jesus, and the reason he comes to Jesus is he's already asked the disciples to help him out, to help his boy be healed from this condition, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't help him. So he comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus to touch his boy, to heal his boy, and and the reason is because the uh, the situation is complex. The disciples are beyond their simplistic answers, and this complex, perplexing situation is, this boy is in need, how is it that he will be healed? So Jesus then puts them on the spot by asking some questions, and he says, how long has this boy been like this from childhood? And then the father says, Ah, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And then Jesus kind of pinpoints that phrase, and he says, if you can, because at that point he's saying, where's your faith? Where's your, the trust element that I have already shown you that I've done multitudes of different miracles. That's why the crowd is running and gathering around him. And I love the Father's statement, because this is all of us. 
I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. All of us as we go through life are a mixture, really, of both believing and doubting at the same time. And sometimes religious leaders tell you that doubt is a no-no. You shouldn't doubt. I'm here to tell you that your doubt is your best friend at times. Because it's what will help you change. It's what will move you from one stage to the other. So let's go back here for just a quick second. We don't go through this cycle once. In our life, we will go through this cycle multiple times. And each time we do, our faith can get a little bit deeper. So in Mark chapter 9, here you have this father that comes and in his doubt in the moment, he says, I do believe. I mean, I've seen what you've done, and that's why I've come to you. Actually, that's why I came to your disciples. And he says, I do believe. Just help my unbelief. That is a great prayer to pray. As we go through life, we'll doubt. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. So, how many of you are familiar with Hans Christian Andersen's story of the princess and the pea? Okay? Well, in a book uh, called Zero Theology, the author John Tucker uh, creates an analogy of the process that we all go through. And I'm just going to read this because I think it's the most succinct way of saying it. Using an old tale told by Hans Christian Andersen, a prince searches around the world for a true princess to be his bride. But something about each potential princess seems inauthentic. One night, in a torrential rainstorm, a soggy woman knocks at the gate, seeking shelter, and claims to be a princess. Could she be the one for the prince to wed, or is she another imposter? The queen devises a plan to test whether this young woman is, in fact, a true princess fit for her son. She puts a pea underneath 20 mattresses and puts 20 thick blankets on top of the mattresses. The next morning... The queen asks the young woman how she slept, and she answers, oh, very badly. I have scarcely closed my eyes all night. Heaven only knows what was in that bed, but I was laying on something hard so that I am black and blue all over my body. It's horrible. Everyone knows then that this is the true princess, for nobody but a real princess could be as sensitive as that, so the prince takes her as his bride. And here's what Tucker says about this old story. He uses a story to suggest that the truest part of us is sensitive to the deepest uncertainties of life, i.e. the P, and we use comforting uh, beliefs and, uh, like mattresses and blankets to protect us from these doubts and these pains. And to the degree we remain sensitive to life's uncertainty and pain in spite of all our layers of self-protection and all our attempts of self-delusion, we reveal our true nobility and authenticity. So there's always a pea under the mattress of faith, always. And it might it'd be different for all of us what that pea is, but the fact that you have doubts and the fact that you're sensitive to it does not mean you don't have faith. It means you have a sensitivity to be honest and real and authentic. Okay? This princess-to-be could have easily said to the queen, oh, fine, right? But the point of the story was she was truthful about something that seems impossible, right? How could a pea break up her night's sleep? Well, sometimes it's the smallest things, Right? They keep bugging us, and we have to work through them. And as we do so, our authenticity is what helps us grow and mature. So I want to wind down today as we finish with this idea just by expressing what uh, I think we do as we walk through this world. We interpret the world around us through a hermeneutic of love. So one last scripture. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6 tells us, For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. There you see the key words, faith, hope. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's quite a statement, isn't it? The thing that really counts in life is your faith expresses itself through love. So when you have doubts about things, the most important thing to remember is when you operate on a hermeneutic of love, you will always be at the center of who God is and what he wants for us as human beings as we seek to flourish in the world in which he has placed us. So what I'm going to do, not this Wednesday night, but uh, a week from Wednesday, we're going to start a new study on Wednesday night. You can always uh, look at this on YouTube if you have interest in it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the deconstructing and reconstructing uh, parts of our faith. And what is it that still stands after the smoke clears? Um, you know, and so if you're interested in that, that will start a week from Wednesday. And uh, I think it's helpful for us. Would you stand with me? Here's what I want to do uh, as we close. We are constantly deconstructing and detangling. Maybe that's even a better word. Detangling our faith. What are we detangling our faith from? We're detangling it from hate, from harm-filled theologies, from self-centered religion, from oppressive economic systems, from anti-LGBTQ plus prejudice, from power and empire, from patriarchy, and from evil politics. Hermeneutic of love. How do you continue to express yourself through love? When you begin to answer that question, you have found, I think, the centerpiece of, love, uh, of faith. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time together today and for the privilege of just scratching the surface on this very important topic. We pray that as we seek to walk in faith, that you'll enable us to go through the different dynamics and go through the different stages of faith and help us to just trust that uh, we will be better for it. Help us to look at life through the lens of love. And as we do so, Father, we ask that uh, we will indeed help others uh, in our walk through this world. For ultimately, the greatest purpose of life is to love well. And I pray that we'll continue to mature in that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great day.